Okay. No worries. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, do you know, and also thank you, Fiona, for inviting me to give this first of your lectures, as it were. Although I'm a little bit concerned that you have had me wired up. All I need is two antennae coming out of here. I've got battery packs around the side of me, and microphones sort of coming in all directions, as it were. So uh, please forgive me, as it were. I'll, I'll, next time I'll put a couple of little horns on that. But reflections on the causes of engineering failure and poor performance. This is really, I suppose, um, a resume, a summary of some of those things that perhaps one has learned over um, a career, perhaps spending, uh, spanning just a few more years that one would care to, uh, to admit to, as it were there. But you, if, you, if you did your mental arithmetic when Matt was talking, you'll see that it was sort of 40 odd or so years, as it were, that we have been looking at. Failure, poor performance, is usually attributed in some way or other to uncertainty. There can be uncertainty in, in a great many ways. It can be uncertainty in errors of judgment, or it could be technical uncertainty, because in engineering, we do not live in a very precise world. Science takes us so far, and then we have to take judgment um, a little bit before, after that. If we look at errors of judgment, what I generally find is that they divide into three groups. What I would call the genuine mistakes. Somebody perhaps knows what should be done, but for some reason makes a mistake there. Or it might be from inadequate or poor training that uh, has occurred, and the person has been put in a role or set in a crisis situation where training has just broken down for some reason. Then there's the, the area of inactivity, where there's been really no malicious intent, I think, to uh, cause a failure, yeah. but people have just not taken the appropriate action when they've been presented with a situation. They comply with a situation rather than um, go to attack that situation in order to get something that they were feeling a little more comfortable with. There is, of course, a deliberate act. Um, malice you don't see so very often when people are discontent about something or they're unhappy with the situation. They deliberately go and, and cause a failure. You do see, surprisingly greatly, a number of non-observance of rules. There are rules, there are safeguards, and for good reason, uh, they, good reason as they think, in trying to get to a maintenance situation or things of that sort of order, they remove those safeguards. Floor plates and engine rooms sometimes see them totally missing, as it were. And uh, you shaft guards and various rotating machinery guards. Oh, it's always going wrong down there. Let's just get rid of that for the moment. Well, that's fine until the floor plates get oily and uh, the ship starts to roll a bit uh, in that way. And it wouldn't be the first time I am, I suspect, uh, many of you there have sort of slid from one side of an engine room to the other on very greasy and oily floor plates in those sort of conditions. Then there's the question of technical uncertainty. We know a lot about corrosion. We know a lot about fatigue and creep and brittle fracture. But there is still an awful lot that we have to learn in those areas so there is uncertainty sometimes in our calculations. When we think of control there, with, that can be either system control, where you've got many interacting layers of control uh, coming in, and you get a bug or something in one layer, and then you find <coughs> it tends to um, take its way through, and you get some rather un 
called for or on certain things that are happening in the total system. Sometimes it's a safety critical system. And then there's the environment. That can either be natural, operational, or the managerial environment in which these things are working. So uncertainty lies at the root of so many of the, uh, the failure and poor performance things. Failure is not new. We can trace it back for different reasons. Failure, some of those are poor performance, some of those are total failure. But this one is perhaps marks the, uh, one of the more significant areas, apart from being giving rise to many films and uh, stories and what have you. It gave rise to the first international convention on the safety of life at sea in, 2000, in, in 2014, in 1914. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's interesting, actually, just literally. Uh, a um, uh, hundred years away from that. That was attended, that, that was such an important fair. It was intended, attended by 16 heads of state. And it gave rise to the things that we take for granted today. The ice patrol, life-saving equipment, provision, or adequate life-saving equipment, the radio telegraphy, the need for a stern power. It might seem surprising that there wasn't a requirement for a stern power in ships at that time. But it was only a few years before that that there were sailing ships, as it were, and design tends to, to involve the need for safety certificates, subdivision, passenger numbers, all of those sorts of things. And so what I thought we might do with your permission over the um, uh, next 15 minutes, 55 minutes or so, is to Try and tease out both from major disasters <coughs> and also some of those things that we have seen where we've had little failures occur, perhaps a shaft has broken, perhaps something else has, has happened there. Uh, see if we can find any common threads through those failures that we might draw lessons and tease out for our future use. Of the major disasters that I'm going to look at, obviously uh, known to most of you there, the uh, Herald of Free Enterprise, Piper Alpha, um, quite amazing at, that, at the height of that um, uh, disaster, the actual amount of natural gas that was being burnt was equal to the UK consumption uh, there on an average time. So it gives you uh, some idea of the intensity of that inferno. Scandinavian star, here. The Nimrod, I thought we might uh, have a look at, of 2007, those areas. Ramsgate, uh, again, just a little earlier. I'm not going to look at um, Costa Concordia at the moment, because there are still issues outstanding for them. It is still too new, I think, to distill those lessons in the, in the wider context, although I think you'll see that there are a number of parallels from all of these that one can see in that particular case. But I'll first start off with just a few cases. Short, stiff shaft line dynamics, the sort of propulsion shafts that you see in tankers and you see in bulk carriers. Very short shafts, very stiff. Very little room for maneuver uh, or movement of the ship around it uh, there. Now, in recent years, from ships being built in the Far East, we have had a tremendous number of failures there. Either failures, let me take this other uh, little weapon, either failures in those areas or failures of that coupling flange there onto the main engine. In that case, it has been largely because one hasn't got the slope right between the bearing and the shaft. In here, the shear force and bending moments have not been right either. Yet, if we go back to the 1960s, mid-1960s, when I first started to come into this industry, we had exactly the same problems, except that was a steam turbine. Well, that was a scene too there, and there was a gearbox sitting there. 
The problems that we had in aligning those shafts to the um, aft end of the gearbox main wheel flange there were shear force and bending. We learned some very valuable lessons, and if you go into the issue of marine engineers, issue of mechanical engineers, um, many of the journals, this was public. You could fill this room with the publications that went on in, 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 at that time. Similarly, at the other end, we found empirical ways of um, getting the correct alignment between shaft and bearing. Again, equal amount of information. Yet somehow, that never found its way to the Far East, and we've been condemned to uh, committing exactly the same mistakes as was happening um, at that time. And what you tend to find is, in this whole area of transfer of technology, that it is essential if we're going to avoid failure, to transfer it not only within companies, Often people think of information as power, and they keep it sort of tucked away uh, down here somewhere. But one has to let that information uh, flow, because otherwise people will make the same mistake. There was a case, I think it was B, um, the uh, uh, BAC or, or something of that sort, or some years ago, had a problem with one of the wings of their aeroplanes, and they crashed it uh, on a test flight. Managing director of that company called all his competitors on, so they shouldn't make that same mistake again, uh, uh, because it was safety critical. And then there's this other little thing here, corporate amnesia. It's, it's, it's a pure cult and term. But the number of times I've gone into companies when they've had failures there and said, this failure with the jolly logic, let's call it, what, what, whatever. Um, didn't you have something like this about seven, eight years ago? No, they say, we don't. We've never seen this sort of failure before. And you say, but yeah, wasn't it something to do with a coupling or a torsional work? Oh, I do remember somebody talking about that. Why don't you get the fire? Oh, we threw those all out after four years because we, didn't, we don't believe in keeping fire. Okay. So you have to put this problem right again, and you start the learning profile again, and you pay a quarter of a million dollars in the process, as it were. You know? So there's a great um, thing that we do need to remember, that transfer of technology is important, both within companies and also um, externally, when uh, areas of an industry move from one part of the world to the other. Then we come to the rate of design progress. In the early years of the century, we saw a significant number of these failures on the raceways of um, polypropulsive areas. Yeah. What was happening at that time yeah, was that if we look at the years and we look at the power output of the shaft, that some of these designs were not actually going on sea track. And they certainly, the feedback from sea trial, from service, was not coming in before units of considerably greater power were being put out. Look at the way that curves came out. Now you might have thought we would have learned that lesson. Because if we think back to the 1970s, when tankers were going from 150,000 tons to 250,000 tons to half a million tons uh, there in very, very short order. We had any number of fatigue problems. And this always seems to happen when you let the rate of design progress get out of the, um, um, or out of kilter with the amount of information that um, is coming back from, from service. <coughs> Again, engineering is not a precise science. Then there's a learning of the lessons from the past. This, as you can see, was a failure. And he had a rather revolutionary type of uh, stern that we saw here. And it produced a very severe weight field. Very, very, very tight 
velocity gradients in there. The industry learnt then that the, the severity of the wake field is important with that ship when you cross the North Sea in it. If you went at one start of the uh, journey and you just put a, a pen mark on the bulkhead, uh, there, the transverse bulkhead in that ship, where you thought the crack was, and then after six hours of belting across the North Sea at, at full power, you would find that crack had grown by about five millimetres, as it were, when you measured it at the other port at the other end. So therefore, the welding gang came on and things of this sort. Well-known thing in the industry. Yet, five, six years ago, second-order harmonic pressures of 22 kilopascals. For those of you not familiar with that, what, what it there should be, you start to get worried if they're greater than three as it were there. And this was purely and simply because people had not bothered to do their model testing correctly and understand what was going on in there. What one actually found in this case was that the water was going backwards through the propeller disc at the top because of the way the ship had been designed and the problems that were occurring um, at that time. We must learn the lessons Pass because otherwise we just accumulate failure after failure. Georges Chantillana, he was a historian and he was thinking of wars um, between nations, discord between countries, whatever. And he said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. He might just as well have been thinking about our own engineering industries there. Because if we don't remember what went on before, we throw records away, uh, so on and so on. Then we are just throwing away our information. And as short uh, as uh, eggs are eggs, if you want an expression like that, we shall fall into those same traps. I've, I've found throughout my life that failure occurs in cycles. Depending on the sort of failure, it might be five years, seven, ten years, or perhaps even fifteen years. But you see this cycle that, um, that comes along. Another interesting area there, insufficient attention to detail. This, was, this is the main opinion, it's a beast of a thing, of an ice-breaking oboe vessel, um, that oil and bond carrier. Being in for maintenance and Somebody hadn't cleaned out the gearbox properly after the maintenance. Little tiny piece of metal, you can just see it there. No bigger than that. There. Got caught up in the mesh, churned up in the oil. There. Got cold welded to the surface. Caused a fatigue failure sitting there. And there was a damage to the tooth at the end of this. Um, uh, at the end of this process. Another example here, for those of you who know piston rods, that should be perfectly straight. I mean, it's a beautiful testament to the ductility of that metal. But you can imagine when it, instead of being straight and connected to the piston, to the um, uh, conduit there, um, you can imagine what it did to the inside of the engine caused because somebody had not read the tightening sequence and instruction on these bolts here. A whole lot fell apart. So inattention to detail is again a major issue where this coming on. Not fully understanding the consequences of an engineering decision. In this case design of a high-speed craft, wanted to lighten the weight of the craft so he could trim it more easily. So instead of using a model uh, shaft, which was a tradition, he decided to go to Tanya, and it worked very well. Yes, it did reduce the weight beautifully, but he forgot there, or didn't even think about the issues with changing from model to, um, to, to tail, 
he machined the, 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 the titanium shaft with the same tool angle settings that he had used for one. And that was abusive machine. He created a whole series of little tiny notches in the shaft, and those notches you could almost write on there, please crack here, as it were, because it uh, gives um, a uh, start for fatigue failure. Here, the designer decided to go for a 1 in 12 taper. There's nothing wrong with a 1 in 12 taper, but if you've got such a steep angle, you've got to have very great control and space to have control over pushing up whatever the mating member uh, is at that, uh, at that point. Where this was actually being set up was a very tight corner of the engine. Yeah. And so there wasn't room to get the uh, necessary control over and didn't achieve the contact fit. And as you can see, fretting fatigue was a result uh, there. The thing lasted two days. Fortunately, that one didn't kill anyone. That killed 12 people, as it were. The achievement of the design intent there. Well, this is all about the ability of designers, production engineers, to understand each other's problems there. It's essential with this sort of situation for experienced engineers to stand back and start to think about the design concept, both in its concept, the deal, the detail, the production processes, how that integrates integra <coughs> with other systems. Because again, my experience tells me that failures occur at the boundaries of systems. Operational expectation. Good example of it here. This is the inside of a diesel engine gudgeon pin. Big thing, that's so, with a hole down the middle. And you're looking at the hole. The designer put a very nice little radius curve here for this oil way. But somehow somebody had to get into this central hole with a tool of some form and perform this drilling operation and this machining operation in this plan. They did the best they could, but put a low quench wax, and hence you can see a fatigue uh, failure starting there. So it's not, it's not a coming together there of uh, all aspects of the design and production process. Education and experience. I was very dismayed in a former life to realize that many engineers who were well-qualified engineers, ostensibly, couldn't tell a piece of brass from a piece of steel. So, uh, I instituted um, training sessions for people who you would have expected having got first degrees or um, second degrees in engineering, there, such that at least they could recognize something that looked a bit like that. Um, say it came out of the copper stable there, and you know, steel, and you could not make a total and complete idiot of yourself because you'd learnt your materials through Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, density, and things of that sort of order. Similarly, continual professional development is essential, providing it's conducted honestly. Now, I've lost count of the number of times when I have gone into a, give a lecture, into a conference, and this conference has been two days, three days, whatever it was. I've only been able to go in there for two or three hours, give a lecture, and as I'm walking out the door at the end of it, the young ladies on the desk are saying, oh, Mr. Carlton, sir, your um, professional, uh, uh, Certificate of um, Continuing Professional Development. Well, what professional development have I actually got for attending a three-day conference for two hours or whatever? These things have got to be done. Honestly, the last time I did that, or the last time that occurred, was only about two months ago. And so one has to um, treat these things very, very rigorously. 
This thing, this is often a cause of failure. The design intention, the system integration, operation expectation. As I said to you just now, failures often occur at the boundaries of systems. But sometimes designers don't get the correct information, or the correct information flows don't come through the whole of the process. Operation expectation can sometimes exceed design intent. Good example of this, obviously a cruise ship. There. She was on her maiden run across the Atlantic. And the critical thing, as far as the commercial part of the organization was, that she be in New York ready to receive a load of travel agents at 3 o'clock one afternoon. The master signaled the, uh, his, the uh, marketing department of this uh, um, company and said, you know, I would love to be there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, but unfortunately there's a storm between me and, and you, as it were. So I'm sorry, I'm going to be late. The next signal comes in from, from the chief executive officer of, the, of that company. Be there at 3 o'clock. So, you do that, you can see that deck, it's not about hosing it down, and you can see they buckled the ship, as it were, in pushing through a storm, exceeding design intent. Management overruling um, a sea star uh, sitting in. I'm not saying all management are bad and all sea staff are good, but um, certainly not the case. But there is another case that is coming up. Change of ownership. Sometimes when a ship changes from one owner to another, the new owner wants to do something totally different, which is out with the design assumptions of the, of the previous area. This one here, operational expectation. That's cruise ship looking down at the propellers. And the, design, the owner wanted the fastest cruise ship. And so he said, to the builder, go and design me a cruise ship which will go at 27 knots. And for every point one of a knot that you get uh, above that, I will give you money back on the price of the, uh, of the, of the thing. So what, what does the builder do? He designs a racing boat, basically. Now we all know cruise ships don't work at their top speed or very rarely work at their top speed. They toddle around depending on where they're going. Five knots, 10 knots, 12, maybe 15 knots of different things. This ship performed beautifully. The designer got 0.3 of a knot above. And for those of you who, who, who know, it's just a basically a cube rule. That's a hell of a lot of um, uh, good design has gone into that in power. But if you were trying to eat your supper in the uh, restaurant at 10 minutes, well, Jane, my wife, often says to me when I'm looking a bit tired, she says, don't go to soup on the menu, will you? Because your head might go forward into me. <laughs> it wasn't a case of my head going into the soup. It was the soup at that sort of speed and the vibration coming up and hitting you one in the face, you know? And so this is the the sorts of issues that, 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 that come along there. Human factors. I've really only been talking there about 10%, um, 15% of failure situations. But human factors account for the rest. They might be fatigue, the not understanding of instructions and information that's presented to them, not appreciation of the train of events that follow a decision. Surprising how many people make a decision and not think one step, two step, three steps ahead. There. The use of a common language, the number of situations that occurred where the crew can't speak to the officers and vice versa. Uh, information levels. If you give too much in a time of crisis, you may not be able to absorb it and therefore make a wrong decision. If you give too little, the same may be um, occurring. 
Also, you've got to match that information to the, to the educational level of the person who is receiving that information. It's no good giving them an answer which they just do not understand. Human capabilities there. We are not so far away uh, from the animals. We've got five senses. Yet most of our modern systems today uh, there tend to require <coughs> to use just two there, which is sight and sound. So therefore, designers need to take account that it's going to take the human a little more time to respond to a situation where he can't use all of his senses. We're not so far down that evolution chain uh, there that we can adapt so quickly. So we need to understand very much reaction times. Task overload. Uh, often companies will try to reduce staff to a minimum to cut costs. Fine. And that may work in the uh, times when everything is running normally and running along beautifully. However, when you get into a crisis situation, something goes bang, or it potentially is going bang around you, this can lead to stress, which can be either mental or physical. There. And that often results in very serious errors uh, being made. This is a sort of a Carlton thought, I suppose. The management of work so as to avoid human fatigue is essential if errors um, and failures are to be minimised. A lot of failures occur because that is not uh, dealt with. Human error takes many forms. The operator can do the job automatically. So he's doing his job automatically. Then something happens over there, whatever it is, catches attention. A mistake occurs because his attention has been distracted. They may find shortcuts, disregard some of the rules. Um, again, ending in disaster. Errors made in situations where the operator doesn't have the knowledge. This is a training one uh, there, which one tends to see. Um, fairly regularly. Human behaviour. Important ways. Training is very important in conditioning um, human behaviour. But when there are situations that you've been working in where things have not gone wrong for a long time, then people will be lulled into a false sense of security. There. And if that develops, safeguards, get into a state of disrepair. <coughs> the reasons for them can even be forgotten. A new employee, you might say, well, I'm going to train this chap, fine. But then if he goes out into the field and people say, oh, I don't take care of that, you know. These people supposedly are the old hands of the game. It takes a very brave individual there to stand up to that and say, no, I'm going to do it this way. From uh, resulting from peer group uh, pressure uh, there. Fatal flaw in that is to assume the supervisor always knows best. Now they were just sort of situated. Now, I just wanted to look at those three cases again, of uh, five cases I think it was, one, so about one slide each. If we look at the Herald of Free Enterprise, Mr. Justice C, uh, she conducted that inquiry there. And he concluded that this call needs say no more than the need for clear and concise orders, strict discipline, attention at all times to other matters affecting the safety of the ship and those on board. There must be no cutting of corners maintenance of proper channels of communication between the ship and the shore for the receipt and dissemination of information and a clear and firm management and command structure. I always think the sad thing about the herald of free enterprise was that you go back to the early 50s 
And here was the Princess Victoria there on the Larmstrom River crossing. In those days, they didn't fit full doors. They only had 1.5, 1.6 meter doors on the stern end. She was in a hell of a sea, got damaged, and the, and the free surface of it was so well known. Yet nobody realised uh, who were operating that ship at that time. Her designers, yes, but in the operation. Piper Alpha, Lord Cullen. I won't read all of those things out, but that was before, that was after. Two work permits had been issued, but they're not being cross referenced there. Work on one wasn't complete when another shift came along and uh, started work somewhere else. That work was completed satisfactorily. Then there was a need to start the pump it was um, completed. I'm paraphrasing that lot there. That pump started there and the loose cover that had been temporarily used as a blanking plate on the job that wasn't completed or wasn't known about. Re um, led to a release of hydrocarbon and hence um, an explosion. The sad thing there is that management had known there was a failure in this whole process of um, recording jobs um, and recording the, the, the whole processes there. Inspectors had been on uh, the ship, on, on, the, uh, on the platform. Uh, before there and had also come up with um, same issues, but they hadn't actually learned and implemented those lessons. Scandinavian star, uh, that's how when she was towed into a steel, um, the fire brigade were trying to finish the job off. Uh, two separate fires were started by an arsonist. The first one was discovered and put out. The second one wasn't discovered for some time. The fire uh, took hold. The cabin partitions were made of a material which released hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide, deadly cocktail, as it were there. There were various maintenance issues with watertight doors that had to be closed manually uh, there and with alarms. The Filipino crew members couldn't speak English and the Norwegian officers couldn't speak Filipino, they could speak English. They'd never conducted a fire drill on that ship um, uh, there, so they hadn't got a clue what to do when um, problems occurred. There was a total lack of knowledge by the officers of the air conditioning system, the exhaust plant for the car deck, and communications on the ship had failed because the captain believed that all the passengers had been rescued and then um, he and the crew took to the boats there and there were passengers still on board. Then there was an inmod. Mr. Haddon Cave found, well actually before one looks at that I think his title for his report was really quite interesting. A failure of leadership, culture and priorities. He found that the loss of the Nimrod was due to a general malaise there, caused by a drastic reorganisation and cost cutting. And this dominated the mindsets of everybody involved. The separate organisation for safety there, which would have actually recognised some of the issues, would have um, uh, had been disbanded and abolished. Project teams were set up which had to look after safety and as well as the management of spares, maintenance and what have you. So the need for safety had to compete with the drive to cut costs. Rather sad story. All the crew were lost for that particular one after uh, the, um, the, the aeroplane had been refuelled. The Ramsgate Link Spoke. Chapman's report to issue of civil engineers 
showed that the prime cause was apparent from the calculations made by the designers and the checkers. They had both made the same conceptual mistake. They had forgotten, essentially, that ships sometimes come in a bit hard on the expanse. And so therefore, and they come in on the skew, on this tidal drift. And they had assumed symmetry, and not assumed that very well. The checkers, to some extent, had followed the designers. He also concluded that the concept was inept there, because there was not a single assembly drawing, full assembly drawing there, such that the whole process could have been put together. So, when failures occur there, it's important to, dis, uh, to distill the reasons for those failures in the sense of a no-blame country. Because as soon as you start chucking blame around, people shut up. There. One needs to sit and rationally analyse that problem. There. And then to pass those lessons on to those who may make that same mistake in the future. This is also true of near-miss situations. Because those near-miss situations are going to be the situations that come and hit you next, as it were, there, if you don't analyse those situations uh, as fully as you would an actual failure. It's also a mistake, in my view, to involve the lawyers too soon. Because while engineers generally will talk to each other, as soon as you bring a lawyer into the scene, uh, their engineers just do that. They shut up. Uh, um, in that one. And I've known, I've known failure situations that have had delays there are five, six years before the real reasons have been sorted out, just because you don't get this um, communion of ideas. So, let us wrap these thoughts up a little bit now and look towards conclusions. We've had a very brief, and I, and I recognise it's a very brief look at uh, some of these inquiries. We've also looked at a load of failure investigations. They lead us to thinking about developing the correct organizational leadership and the culture in, in, in companies where there is a free and open discussion. Correct management objectives and responsibility provision of the correct levels of training and education, sometimes all too lacking. Developing very importantly the correct information flows and adequate communications there. And in the adequate communications I would, inc I would include a common language. You know, I've lost count of the number of ships I've been on where the officers can't talk to the crews. In, in the general sense. Uh, there's perhaps one or two crew members who can understand a form of pidgin English. Uh, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Proper design reviews, controlling the rate of design progress. You know, there's the old saying, you know, we, we must learn to walk before we can start running, uh, sitting in there. And that is often as much business driven as it is a fault of engineering uh, that is sitting. The proper distillation of the lessons learned and the transfer of technology. And I come back again to the reporting of near misses. So, concluding remarks, or if you like, Carlton's view of the world uh, there. I believe that if you're trying to minimize, and you'll never cure the failure, because we are just not that clever when we are starting with a blank sheet of paper, as it were there. But to minimise failure, I think you need to develop in organisations an effective lead leadership and organisational culture. The responsibility of management, I think, is to create an environment where there can be free discussion of safety and reliability issues. Think of some of the examples. Herald of Free Enterprise is a good example. 
Piper Alpha is a good example. The ship that was driven across the Atlantic, at a, a, sort of like a Formula One racing car, is a good example uh, of that sort of area. When the failures occur, establish as quickly as possible the root cause of the incidents within that thing called a no-blame country. It's very difficult to get that uh, sometimes, particularly when you've got uh, competitors um, uh, coming uh, at you from all angles. But then communicate that as widely as possible. Divorce the safety function from the, op the operational cost management functions there. If you confuse those two, then safety is usually the one that, uh, that drops out. In there. Learning the lessons from past experiences, terribly important. Because if you don't learn those lessons, you will actually be condemned to repeat those. Systematic design reviews are absolutely essential as is operational practices. The importance of risk assessments, again, a very important uh, aspect there. Giving proper training to personnel, but training which not only covers the operational, normal operational circumstances, but the crisis situation, such as when the lights go on, in, in an engine room or wherever. You can almost go to whichever valves it is that you need, blindfold, and take the appropriate action into there. Also, and this again is another training issue, training people to think beyond the immediate decision that they're taking. Again, we have seen this in so many of those examples this evening. If they don't think beyond the first action as to what the consequences of that are going to be, then there is potential trouble. Then there's the importance of presenting information to watchkeepers, operators, whatever, which is consistent with their training, such that they don't have to sift through a load of data and think, what the heck does that mean? And it suddenly dawns on what that means when there's a bang in the engine room. In, in there. The need for common language, we've said that uh, several times. And operators don't need to be deluged with information. They need the amount of information necessary to make the right decision. That's in part not just chucking everything at them, but perhaps taking some um, uh, cognizance of really what that is trying to mean. So one is perhaps thinking, perhaps aiding it with neural nets, fuzzy, fuzzy logic and things of that sort of order. And the effect of um, sufficient and disciplined maintenance. We saw those two very expensive examples um, sitting there, and it was maintenance hadn't been properly carried out. But we also saw it in Piper Alpha. We saw it in the Nimrod case. So I think I would like to leave the last word with Her Majesty. And it's so true of what we've been talking about today. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we wish we had been done differently or not at all. Okay, she was talking of the Irish situation, but equally it is the, uh, the same uh, for engineering. Thank you very much for listening.